today I have a special guest named Adasa Fale. And Adasa is a very interesting person because not only does she have sickle cell, but she also has type 1 diabetes. And she's a, a mentor for her program in the UK. And so she does a lot for the people with sickle cell. And she mentors people with sickle cell disease and trains them and, and helps them be better people. So I'm excited to have Adasa on and have her share her story. So Adasa, um, yeah, what's it like uh, having your mentorship program for the sickle cell youth? Hi everyone, thanks for for having me. I hope hopefully I'm the first UK guest that you have the book. Oh yeah, British guest. <laughs> you are, yeah. Um, oh, perfect. So yeah, no, it's it's really um, an honour to to be a part of this program, um, and I can I can give you a bit of a bra- background to the program. So in the UK, we have um, a, a charity called the Sickle Cell Society. Uh, which is a lot of S's, I know, um, but it's it's something that um, a lot of people with sickle cell in the UK really rely on. Um, and we do lots of different projects, but the main project that I focus on and am a part of is the Sickle Cell Children and Young Persons Peer Mentoring Programme. So it's a programme where we basically get um, anyone that's be- between the ages of 10 to 24 and we pair them with patients who also have sickle cell um, and give them some mentoring over a period of six months. We build up a relationship with them. We speak to them about what their challenges are. So we know that between the ages of 10 to 24, it's such a challenging time anyway because you're growing up and there's so many different transition periods that you go through. But then when you have a long-term health disorder like sickle cell we know that it's so much more challenging because you've got to think about how you take care of yourself with this disorder as well so we really really strive to give that mentoring to as many people as possible right now it's in London which is our capital for anyone watching Um, and then we also have mentoring in another place um, in the northwest of the country so Manchester, Liverpool and Sheffield which will be starting soon in November so we're hoping to reach more and more patients who are between the ages of 10 to 24. We haven't forgotten about the adults but of course that age group just needs so much more (laughs) Um, and so yeah it's been really rewarding, it's really lovely to meet young people well younger than myself (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, who, who are just amazing young people who have goals, who have aspirations and it's just amazing to to see them achieve that through the program yeah that's it's so awesome because I've always wished that I had a mentorship program when I was young uh for me like one of the hardest things about having sickle cell is that like I had no one with the disease to talk to about and Mm -hmm. so you know I had family and, and, and friends but no one could really understand the pain and back then I was even embarrassed to share my story so it's it's good that you have a program like that. And for you personally, what has it been like mentoring people? I've I've always um loved the idea of mentorship, and I've I've always wanted to be a part of a sickle cell mentorship program. So, what is it like mentoring kids with sickle cell? Yeah, well, thank you for your question. And firstly, I'd like to say that I feel exactly the same way as you. Um, I'm the only person in my family with sickle cell. Mm-hmm. And I always would go to clinic appointments and ask my consultants, like, is there anyone like me or is there anyone no. I can speak to? Um, and I just, I didn't have any friends. There's no one in my family. So I yep. shared that same feeling of loneliness and a little bit of alienation as well, because you just don't know if there's anyone that's like you. Yeah. Um, so I, I definitely share that feeling. Um, that feeling is gone now <laughs> because yeah. I have a whole community um, that I can talk to. And how does it feel working on the program? Um, I think it's the most, probably the most best rewarding thing I've done um, so far in my, in my sickle cell journey. Honestly, before working on the program, I don't think I used to speak about sickle cell that much. Wow. Um not that I was hiding it was more just 
yeah, it's just something that I have and I just have to deal with it. And it, it wasn't until I had a really bad crisis um, in the peak of the pandemic. I know in America, it didn't um, affect as many places as, as badly as it did maybe in the UK. But we went into full lockdown and I had to shield for two years because I'm clinically vulnerable. Um, mm. And it it wasn't until I had a really bad crisis brought on by the fact that I caught COVID. And that oh, was the reason. Wow. Yeah, it was it was really challenging. So that was the reason why I signed up for the program because it it was probably the most loneliest, worrying, stressful time in my life where wow. I just actually I just I I think I lost all hope. I think I lost a lot of hope. I was very lonely. Hmm. I didn't know what else to do really because I'd finished all of my studies. I didn't know if I was going to get a job because, of course, the pandemic and, you know, it wasn't until I saw that job post that I thought, you know what, there's other people that I could probably help, other young people that are feeling exactly the same way as me. Mm -hmm. And it's been the best thing ever since, having community, having people to speak to, having um, people who can advocate for you on your behalf when you're not able to, um, and just being able to have people around you that just understand, mm -hmm. that just get it, because they, they do, they just, they get it. Yeah. So, yeah, probably the best, um, most rewarding thing I've done so far. Wow, that is, that's that's great to hear. I'm, I'm glad that you're able to find fulfillment uh, mentoring people with sickle cell. That's, that's beautiful. And sorry to hear about you having COVID. Uh, I mean, the pandemic hit America pretty hard too. And one thing, that I was particularly worried about was the fact that I had sickle cell disease and there was COVID. And I know for me, it was like very psychologically hard because um, I know you already know how COVID was affecting people without sickle cell and then us being clinically vulnerable and having like a lower uh, immune state. I was, I was even more worried. So mm -hmm. when I, there was actually a time I thought I had COVID but I think I was just panicking and I didn't actually have it. Oh, wow. But um but that panic state made me think that I was in a I had COVID and, and I ended up going to the hospital only to figure out that I didn't. Uh so you actually had COVID and I'm curious what was that like having COVID and do you feel like it conflicted with your sickle cell? uh yes it did um it was it came on really strong I know that I've spoken to a few people that have had COVID both people who have sickle cell and both people who who don't have sickle cell mm -hmm. and I think with COVID it did affect everyone differently still does affect everyone differently um I think for me it definitely played on my weaknesses, which mm. are, of course, having sickle cell, but also being type 1 diabetic. And I got ill very, very quickly. Mm. Um, it was, it, it just happened very, very quickly. Um, and it, it was over a weekend, really. I felt unwell the Friday. The Saturday I was worse. The Sunday I was even worse. And the Monday morning, early hours, I went into full-blown crisis. And, you know, from a sickle cell perspective, most people will tell you that they tend to sickle in certain places. So it might be their arms. It might yeah. be their knees. It might be their back or or somewhere. For me, it's usually the hip or the, the knees oh, wow. or the, the hands mostly. Wow. And, um, but this time it wasn't anywhere that I'd had it before. It was everywhere. <laughs> oh, it was everywhere. Um, and it just spread so, so quickly. When I ended up going to the hospital that morning, it was a Monday morning, I came to hospital and they said, did you know that you had COVID? And I said, no, I just felt oh. unwell at the weekend. I thought I had tonsillitis. Um, the, crisis, the crisis pain was um, out of this world. It was, it was something oh, I've never ever experienced before. Um, on top of that, I had the COVID aches, the famous COVID aches that everyone <laughs> felt. They're not nice. Um, so I was in a lot of pain um, and I spent five weeks in hospital. Um, it was a long time in hospital, uh, in the same room, same same 
hospital meals every day um yeah. and i ended up having a uh, getting a blood clot as well i developed a blood clot in my arm mm. uh, my left arm which uh, was very painful so it um it definitely played on the sickle cell it played on the diabetes as well because from a diabetes standpoint when you get unwell they always say you must continue to take your insulin which i did but because my body was under so much stress when i presented at the hospital I had something called diabetic ketoacidosis. Yeah. So yeah. Um it DKA. It, DKA. DKA is the short it's the short term, yes. So um that was yeah, that was very scary as well. So I I just really wasn't well and COVID definitely um threw a spanner in the works. I was fine and then I just wasn't. So yeah, it wasn't the best experience. Um, and since then, I don't think I've ever had COVID. I've maybe had flu or a cold. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I've been managed. I managed to like to not get it again. I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I had. Yeah, when when I have a sickle cell crisis, uh, for me, because you said like everyone has a sickle cell crisis in like particular areas i know exactly what you mean mm. for me it's like on my arms it will happen on mm. my arms or uh, um the worst part the worst place for me is my back it, it, if it happens mm. in my back then it's it's a really bad one for me and so i i i empathize with your pain uh but one thing i've noticed about you at least the few times we've, we've interacted and I, I i like about you is like you know despite all the traumatic pain you go through and having both sickle cell and type 1 diabetes i already know what it's like to have sickle cell i don't know what it's like to have diabetes you despite having all those conditions like you're always very like cheerful and positive and you have a smile on your face which i absolutely love and admire because i know that's not hard to do so i'm curious like where do you manage to keep your optimism that's such a good question um I think it's mostly because I just have I feel I feel if you do think negatively things tend to things tend to spiral and I think going back to my example of being in hospital for five weeks with COVID I was probably at my lowest point mentally. Uh-huh. Um, I was not. I, I was not thinking positively at all. Yeah. Um, I just thought, you know, I'm probably going to die here. I'm so unwell. I was like, I was crying every day. And don't get me wrong. Like since then, I've had other admissions where I found it really difficult. But that one really sticks out to me. Mm-hmm. And I think. You know, when people say to me, oh, you're so positive, like, how do you remain upbeat? I think it's just because in the past where I've maybe slipped and not remained positive. Yeah. It's just tended to last so much longer than it needs to. So (laughs) I think as much as it is difficult and it is hard and you do have a cry sometimes and it is sometimes really taxing on your mental health, you've got to find a way to, to just keep going because I sometimes just say to myself you know I am gonna come out of hospital and when I do I'm gonna have this planned I'm gonna see my friends I'm gonna see my family I'm gonna see my dog yeah (laughs) (laughs) me and you know it's just you've got to find a way to look forward and look outside of the four walls that you're stuck in because Mm -hmm. it will come to an end and you know you have to just think about how you're gonna cope when you get out um so yeah I just I try and think positively um I try and keep a smile on my face it's not always easy yeah yeah you have you have good days and bad days I definitely have good days and bad days yeah Um, I'm sure you know what I mean (laughs) I know what you mean yeah no I I would definitely say I'm a very positive optimistic person who loves to smile and 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 be positive and inspiring. I, however, I mean, I, I have something called Ike Inspiration where, like, it's just to, you know, be of inspiration to people. But I'm not going to lie, when I'm going through my sickle cell crisis, I'm a whole mm-hmm. nother person. Like, uh, yeah. I'm super grumpy. Mm-hmm. I'm super, like, pissed. <laughs> and I don't like how I am. I'm going to be honest. But yeah. my attitude is just not the way it, it needs to be. 
it's it's I I I, I tend to not be as patient, and I tend mm-hmm. to just kind of want like if I'm being nursed or cared for, like I'm I can be a bitch to whoever like is nursing me. I'm not gonna lie, and I know it's not good. But I understand that feeling. I'm sure you, you understand. It. You could understand. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and so, uh, so I guess, though, when you're not going through those times, it makes me even more grateful because I know what it's like to, to, to be in so much pain. And so for me, when I wake up just simply like healthy, like mm. my threshold for being happy is so much lower because I'm just, I'm just happy. I'm just healthy. It's like, you know, and so mm-hmm. any day I'm not in a crisis, it's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So <laughs> that, that's what it's like. Um, and so I'm, I'm just, I'm so curious to learn about your personal journey, your personal health journey. Cause I, I, you know, I don't meet too many people with sickle cell and then I don't even meet many people who have type one diabetes. Mm-hmm. You know, what is it like having both, and how do you cope with both disease states? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, I think so. I'll I'll speak a little bit about my journey with both sickle cell and um, type one diabetes. Um, I was I was diagnosed with sickle cell at three months old. Um, in the UK, we have something called a screening program. So it's genetic screening. You might have something similar in the US. Um, but this screening program is it was introduced in the year 2000. And essentially, it's used to screen for genetic diseases, um, one being sickle cell. But obviously, I was born a little bit before 2000. So it wasn't completely in the swing of things um when it came to screening so um my parents I think they just they miss the fact that um you know they could potentially have a child with with sickle cell because my dad wasn't aware that he carried the sickle trait but my mum was aware that she carried beta thalassemia um but because it just wasn't something that was offered in terms of screening etc um and of course like my dad's family didn't think that they had it anyway it was kind of just brushed under the carpet um so I was diagnosed at three months old with sickle cell and then later on I got my full diagnosis which was sickle cell beta thalassemia so I got the sickle uh, gene from my dad and then my beta thalassemia gene from my mum Um, And then when I was three years old, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And there's no real reason why people get type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, oh, yeah, well, it's environmental factors or, you know, if one of your family members has it, you're likely to have it. But in actual fact, I've only got one distant cousin on my dad's side that has it. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, it's just something that they've not been been able to pinpoint why people get it. They just... They just get it. Mm-hmm. Um, and how has it affected me over the years? I found it honestly really, really tough, really, yeah. really difficult. Um, because they both, I think, interact with each other in a negative way. It's really difficult to control blood sugars anyway when you're just diabetic because I do follow a few diabetes pages and I see how people have struggled yeah. with it. And then when you throw in sickle cell, um, especially when you're very prone to infections, you know, I'm always getting something. I'm I'm always ill with something. I'm always getting some kind of like tonsillitis or chest infection. So when you throw that spanner in the works, it really does make it so challenging to control both. Um, I think I became more aware of how they both interacted as I've gotten older. So when I've had admissions, especially in adult clinic where you're, you you know, when you're like 16, 17, 18, you're expected to just go to your clinic appointments on your own. Mm -hmm. Um, I know it's a little bit different different in America because I've spoken to some American um, consultants, uh, sickle cell consultants. So they've told me that they're they're a bit older when (laughs) when they do healthcare transition. Mm-hmm. Um, in the UK, you're treated as an adult when you're 16. So um, I just I had to be in control or in better control when my parents weren't around. Um, it has been it has been so challenging, and 
yeah. controlling both can sometimes be such a challenge even in hospital um when you know you're supposed to be getting the care and usually usually nurses do care for you but you 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 still have to do your insulin injections which is really difficult when you're in pain yeah oh wow yeah yeah so there's that as well so it's really tough to keep up with injecting yourself when actually what if my hand is swollen or I'm having a crisis in my elbow and I can't reach around to do an injection so there's those challenges which I think people don't really know about yeah it's not it's not common I don't think I've ever met a person like me no 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 I I as though is is not common at all um what you ha- what you have is not common and I can I I can only imagine what what is what is going through I mean one from a clinical perspective just for doctors and nurses to even understand like okay like what what kind of medications I need to give her or does this diabetic medication mm-hmm. interact with this sickle cell medication and this and that that can already be complicated and then like from a psychological standpoint, I can only, I, I yeah, I can only imagine what you what you feel like. Because to be honest, I don't struggle with this as much. But when I was younger, I would literally always be questioning like God, like God, why why do I have this? Like this doesn't make any sense. I don't deserve this. I'm a good man. I'm a good kid. I don't do anything to anyone. Why do I have this? But but, but for you to have like two of them. Yeah, I can only imagine what you what the pain you 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 must be under and 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 and, and the toughness you know to, mm. to do all of that. Yeah, no, it, it is tough, and I think from a young age, you especially in clinics, you know, they really encourage um, children and young people from a young age to start being able to explain their condition to someone. So we always practice it on the program as well. You know, how would you explain it to someone that doesn't know you? Yeah. You know, in case anything happens, you might be out on your own. Maybe mum and dad aren't there. So how would you explain it if you said that you've got sickle cell? And so I, from a young age, would practice with my parents and try and explain it to them, back to them, in my own words. Um, And honestly, I found I found things like school really challenging explaining Mm -hmm. it to teachers. And for the longest time, I think my teachers thought that it was just the same condition. They've got so many other children to take care of. They yeah, it just slipped their mind that it could be like two different conditions. Yeah. So it's yeah, it was actually I actually did have a teacher that said to me, "Oh, I didn't I didn't actually realize you were type one diabetic." I thought. I thought it was just sickle cell, so, <laughs> and that was when I was leaving. So that was yeah. quite a shock. That all those years, it it can sometimes be difficult for people to get their head around. And you mentioned from a clinical perspective, dealing with different medications, like what can you give to a diabetic and what yeah. can't. You give? Um, and it's it's something that comes up quite a lot. So things like steroids, mm-hmm. I can't be given that because it makes your blood sugars. Oh yeah, high. yeah um and i can't be given things like you know when you go to hospital when you're you're giving pain relief a lot of the main main pain relief we get is like morphine and we might be giving it in sort of like a syringe and i can't have the aura morph because it again it's it makes my blood sugars high and it interacts with me in a different way than it would with another person so there's just certain things that i can't have <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah, that that's 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 very interesting to hear. And so, for you personally, uh, I'm just curious. Like, this disease state feels more like a burden for you, or uh, you know, it's harder to to manage. Uh, I get this question a lot, and I think this might surprise people because. I think people expect me to say another one, (laughs) but Mm -hmm. I would say sometimes um, diabetes because Mm -hmm. um, I think the way that it triggers my sickle cell is, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, It I think it triggers it a lot more Mm -hmm. because, you know, if for whatever reason my blood sugar is high, I tend to get more severe pain. Um, 
because you know if your blood sugar is high your blood is like syrup um trying to get through your vessels whereas in a normal person they're just dealing with the blockage the sick like of the sickle cells being blocked in a blood yeah. vessel they're not dealing with the fact the fact that the blood is thick because there's too much sugar in it as well yeah um it's really hard to say sometimes because you know from a diabetic perspective i inject maybe four to six times a day whereas with sickle cell i do deal with everyday pain as well so it's kind of a matter of okay would you get rid of having to yeah. do four injections or would you get rid of the pain <laughs> yeah. Which, i mean in in a ideal world i would say both i don't want either of it yeah, <laughs> i don't want none of it yeah um so i think it honestly changes day to day because as i said i like i have good days and i have really bad days and sometimes more bad days than good days and mm -hmm. even when you find stay positive it can sometimes just feel like too much and there's something called um diabetic fatigue which is where you just feel so tired of having to keep up with everything with the injections with testing your blood sugar making sure you're always in yeah. the counting carbohydrates making sure that you're eating i'm constantly thinking about food and what i'm going to eat because yeah. it has a direct effect on me um and so you think to yourself oh, i just don't want to do it anymore so that's what diabetic fatigue is but you can't skip an injection you can't it's it's so dangerous if you do it and then equally equally from a sickle cell standpoint you can't not take your antibiotics because your sleep yeah. is affected you can't not take whatever treatment you're taking because sure. you will end up in hospital so it's um it's tough all round. I think it changes on a daily basis. If I'm having a good diabetes day, then it might I might say, oh well, actually I'll keep the diabetes, and then um get rid of the sickle. But yeah, I I work. I'm a pharmacist and I work for United Healthcare, and I actually specifically work with diabetic patients. And so when I talk to them, yeah, I never heard of the term diabetic fatigue. But mm. they do have so much that they need to worry about because they have to monitor their blood sugar. They have mm. to watch what they eat. They have to be consistent with the amount of insulin they take. Then they mm. have to also, like, put the injections. And some of those injections, uh, according to the patients I speak to, like, it really hurts. And so, like, <laughs> there's a lot to think about. And I never even, I never even like, thought of it like that. But, mm. yeah. I, when when you when I mean I I only have sickle cell I don't have diabetes so I don't know what it's like to have diabetes but because I, every time when I ask you that question I just think about my sickle cell pain and I would expect you to say diabetes but I mean sickle cell but there's so much upkeep to diabetes that I never even considered yeah. you know I, I quite frankly with my sickle cell I on the, the only upkeep I really have is just taking hydroxyurea. And mm -hmm. drinking a lot of water, like, yeah. for the most part. I don't really have to consider so much other stuff, like what I eat, how I eat it. Mm -hmm. uh, look at my blood sugars, and I have to check that all the time, and or maybe my A1C and all that. Mm -hmm. So I can see where, where <laughs> why you would say that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, from even from a sickle standpoint, I think I do think about my um, nutrition as well. Okay. Just because, you know, all of us, we have, with sickle cell, you have the anemia automatically. Yeah. Automatically, you just get anemia. And then, so I think about, you know, including leafy greens and making sure that I'm having lots of vegetables and like and fiber. And and then from a, from a diabetic standpoint, fiber is good because it kind of slows down the, the digestion and helps to aid that and it's, it's better for you. So I suppose they do both go hand in hand when it comes to certain things like like nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes to the upkeep, I do think there's more, it's more of a demand when it comes to diabetes. But then again, you know, with sickle cell, I'm like you, I take hydroxy as well. Um, I take my penicillin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I take my folic acid for my iron. But then there's other people that I've met, especially through the sickle community that, have to keep up with their blood transfusions. Oh, yeah. They do blood exchanges. Um, a lot of them have a port already, like a port that is already in their, their vein. Okay. So it's easier to do those 
treatments but I honestly um I think from a diabetic standpoint the constant injections yeah or you know it, you know where you get your injections it gets really sore and it gets really itchy and raised and just not just not nice um and I suppose with sickle cell depending on how many times you go into hospital and how many times you deal with pain at home I'm more someone who deals with it at home Mm -hmm. (laughs) I probably should go in a bit more but I deal with most of them at home unless it's a really bad one yeah um and yeah I think it's quite invasive when you do go to hospital because you are full of different ports and cannulas and lines and wires etc so yeah yeah it's 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 I think they both have their cons (laughs) cons <laughs> yeah yeah and i guess honestly it's probably at the time it's like whatever you're going through the most so i'm sure when you're having a sickle cell crisis you probably would say oh, i don't want sickle cell but when your mm. diabetes are acting up you probably pick diabetes. Yeah. so yeah I, and, and i can relate to that need to want to stay at home as long as possible mm. and not go to the hospital because sometimes um just going to the hospital can be depressing and it can be like a reminder of like I guess I don't want to say your failure but just how poor your health is yeah and depending on where you go there's just some hospitals that don't deliver great care uh yeah and so I'm in Bo- I used to live in Boston and I felt like the medical system there was a lot better now I live in Atlanta and don't okay. get me wrong I love Atlanta it's a great city I, I love it I, I I don't see myself leaving but one of the things that's not so good about it is like their healthcare system isn't as up top to notch so when i'm in the hospital there i don't feel um as cared for or i don't feel i don't trust their system as much to be honest so i try to if i'm going through pain i i try to take care of myself to the best of my abilities at home but obviously if it gets really bad we got to go you know yeah you do you do have to go because um it's i think the earlier you go the better the better it will be for you because you can escape any long-term things that come from it. So, you know, I've I've heard some really tragic stories where you yeah. know, maybe people have delayed it and ends up in a really bad way because they've delayed going to yeah. hospital. And they might delay for many reasons. They might just say, actually, I don't think I'm that bad. Or they yeah. say, I'm, I'm a bit scared. I don't know if they're going to take me seriously. So... There's, I think there's loads of different reasons, but I think if you can catch things early, yeah, it's better to just go. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, and and obviously you have to fill it out because there are some times where like you have the pain and you can feel it, but it's like very minimal and it might go yeah. away. I don't know if you know that pain. I I have that a few times, so I don't think that would warrant a hospital visit because then you be in the hospital like ten I don't know, all the time. But yeah. then just times where it's like you can just tell it's full blown and it's not normal and he's like all right i gotta go so yeah yeah, it's it's, it's essentially a lot of listening to your body and so you know you have these two disease states and you talked about how like your diabetes affects your sickle cell um does your sickle cell affect like your diabetes yes how so i would say it affects it in the way that let's say my blood sugar is fine like it's it's doing fine it's you know there's it's in range and you know it I'm coping fine from a diabetes standpoint if I go into crisis I notice that my blood sugars are a lot harder to control and I think that just goes back to just science in the sense that when it comes to your blood just how your blood is like going around your body yeah in your veins, through your organs, etc. Your body relies on that to carry oxygen around, of course. And that's the whole reason why sickle cell is so severe. Because when you go into crisis, that's not happening. You know, your blood is stuck wherever you've got the pain. It's not going to those organs. And that's why the pain is so excruciatingly painful. But when you think about diabetes, um, you know, you need one once you do that in insulin injection you need that blood to travel around your body to go to the right organs to make sure that your blood 
comes down to a normal level. But when you've got that blockage, the blood's not moving anywhere and you've injected this insulin, it's definitely not going anywhere because you've got this blockage. And so it becomes just a cat and mouse game of, you know, do I inject more? Do I leave it? What happens if I leave it? Um, sometimes I find that injections are just not working at all, like my body's not responding to it. And so I have to go on something called an insulin infusion, mm-hmm. um, which is where they essentially um, put it through a vein. They'll put the insulin through a vein mm-hmm. and they'll put it on a sliding scale where they just it keeps dripping in all, mm-hmm. all day long, all night long through the vein. And that's usually something that brings me down. Um, so yeah, I think it, it definitely does. It definitely does. But it's sometimes hard to work out what's happened. Yeah. Is it did did the diabetes play up play up first? Yeah. Was it the sickle or do, do I have an infection? Because that will set me off. So Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that's that's tough. I, I one of the things I talk a lot about in my channel with sickle cell disease is like I, I try to keep people aware of like the possible triggers that can cause your sickle cell because mm-hmm. I feel like for most crises there's always a trigger. I, yes. I, in my opinion, in my opinion, like I, right. and I think there's a lot of sickle cell warriors that don't have that belief. Like some people just connect it to the flu or it's like, oh, it's just happening. And no, I try no, to no. educate people like that's not the case. There's always something that's causing it. And like if you have that belief, then you're just gonna keep having crises without being able to control it. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, however, in your case, like it's just it gets even more complicated because your diabetes can potentially trigger that, and and you mm-hmm. have so many things that you need to be even more aware of, which is which is um wow, it's it's interesting because you have to be aware of your sickle cell, and then you have to be aware of your diabetes. Yeah. You have to be aware of how it co-mutually interacts with each other, and it's like, wow, that's 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 a, that's a lot, you know. Yeah, yeah, it is a lot. I always say that, um, like, taking care of myself is a full-time job. <laughs> <laughs> because it is. It's like, it's 24-7. Um, yeah. And you're quite right that, you know, there is... Um, triggers is yes. there is always a trigger there was it was always a trigger whether it's extreme weather i think yes. before before people would say oh well it, it's only if you get cold actually no, no. If, you, no. if you're in extreme heat or yes. end up in extreme heat for and coming from a cold climate that can set you off you know if you've got if you've gone through quite a stressful period that can set you off if you have overexerted yourself, whether yes. through exercise or just doing too much too yes. soon, that can set you off. Um, and it's it's just something that people, and we teach this on the program that young people definitely need to be aware of. You know, yes. I think they they have their friends who don't have sickle cell, yes. don't have any um, health care um, or health health concern. And so they're trying to keep up with them yeah maybe overexert themselves or maybe maybe they're dressing not appropriately for the weather and yes. you know it sets them off so i i definitely agree with you on that ike in the sense that there is always a trigger you just, sometimes you just can't pick out which it, one because it's hard yeah and, yeah and 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 i'm so glad that you're talking about this because it's one of the things i really try to hamper on on my channel to one one is it gives people more hope that you you can actually do something about it, and two like it's just it's just true like I when I was younger and I used to have a lot more crises. I loved playing basketball and that was definitely one of my triggers. And like you said, I I I, I didn't want to feel like I was left out, so I always try to compete with the guys, mm-hmm. and I didn't want to take breaks, and I and I didn't and I just let my ego overtake me. Like I didn't say hey i i couldn't tell people hey i wanted a break like you know because because you know i'm young i want friends i want to you know especially when you're playing basketball and you're playing well like you don't want to leave and then um it's very embarrassing it's like you're like playing five on five and like you literally have to leave and then everyone like has to stop or like it's just kind of it's like a weird dynamic so yeah it's i i um i know exactly what you mean and um i'm glad that you are another sickle cell warrior that that 
that can testify to that. It's just that sometimes with sickle cell, you don't know what you don't know, and some of the triggers mm. can be very small. I know some people who are sickle cell, and they say some medications trigger the sickle cell disease. Um, you know, and so it's I just yeah. it's, I just think it's very important that um we we stay aware of that. Um, so I I, I also just want to you know talk about um the state of sickle cell in general in the UK because that's also really fascinating you know whenever i'm talking about sickle cell disease i'm usually speaking from a perspective of uh, from an american and yes. <laughs> that's just where my life has been i'm in america all the time like you know mm-hmm. and so i can only really speak to that experience but you know there's sickle cell disease in india the sickle cell disease and all over in just different countries and a lot of my audience is actually indian people which is I, I, it's cool. I embrace really? it. Yeah, yeah. It's like I just have I have people from all over the country, and and so it's some some of the UK. So, um, you know, what what what's what's the state of sickle cell like in in the UK? Do you feel like there's anything unique about it? Yeah, I mean, so the UK is obviously tiny compared to the US. Yeah, <laughs> we're a tiny little island, but actually, when you look at the um level of prevalence um against the population so we've we've actually got about 17,500 to 18,000 roughly um people living with sickle cell in the UK um and for a long time people thought it was 15,000 that it and that it was staying at 15,000 when actually we've we've grown so that means there's more babies being born with sickle cell. It means that, you know, things that we do at the society, which is raising awareness and especially promoting the screening program to make sure that people know if they have the trait, um, make sure people are aware when it comes to family planning. Um, that's something that we really think is is very important. So, um it, yeah, we do have quite a few patients. Most of them live in the UK. Well, they live in, in the capital of the UK, which is obviously London. Um, but more people are starting to move out of London, which is why we're trying to do more outreach work outside of London. Mm. Um, I would say that sickle cell in the UK is a little bit different to America. I believe we had someone come and visit from Atlanta, um, a, a consultant, mm. Um, just a few weeks ago, actually, and she was talking to us a little bit about how sickle cell is in Atlanta. And I think you've got about 3,000 people mm-hmm. um, in Atlanta with sickle cell now. Atlanta's probably, I don't know, my geography's not that great. Yeah, it's okay, yeah. Atlanta's probably really big. I mean, quite vast. Yeah, you know? one thing about Atlanta um, for people in America is that Atlanta has the largest amount of people with sickle cell disease in the country. It's just that, yeah, it's, I didn't know that until I moved here, but yeah, Atlanta okay. has a lot of sickle cell warriors. Yeah. But 3,000 feels small. It feels, <laughs> it feels yeah, like there's Atlanta, not that many. Atlanta is not, like, Atlanta is not a state or a, oh, well, I, I see what you're saying. I don't, I don't, no, the number three thousand. To be honest, I I don't know that. To be honest, that sounds small. I don't I don't really know where that number came from. But Atlanta yeah. is just like a it's like a city. It's not like a state. Like you know what I'm saying? It's just like a little part of the U. It's like a very small city. Um, but honestly, three thousand. I don't know. That doesn't sound right to me. But I don't know. Maybe I have to look into that number. Yeah, I mean, yeah. but it's Atlanta, Georgia, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. So Georgia, I mean, I can't even begin to imagine because I think some I, I've I've read this that sometimes yeah. crossing states can take about eight hours. <laughs> 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 so, um, comparing it to our tiny tiny little yeah. island, the UK, um, well England specifically, um, is yeah eighteen thousand is all of us. It it represents all of us that live in the UK with sickle cell. I think it's um I think there are some differences that are quite interesting. So the fact that you have hydroxy, yeah. you also have hydroxy. And what I found interesting is that you offer it to people to, to children who were much younger. So mm. our, our, the doctor that came to visit us mentioned that she has heard that people have been offered it at like nine months old. 
yeah yeah like babies <laughs> yeah 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 um we can't forget that hydroxy is obviously a chemotherapy based yeah. drug um which helps with fetal hemoglobin in in patients with sickle cell disorder um but i think in the uk we offer it to children who are a bit older um mm -hmm. that was that was actually quite interesting because i think the standards and what is allowed in the uk is different to maybe in america even though it's the exact same treatment mm -hmm. so you, you'd think it, it would be the same but i think there's different guidelines isn't there between yeah two different places and then i think the last time we spoke we spoke about voxellator didn't we yes we did and you had a different name for it and i can't remember the name <laughs> ox, ox, we call it oxbrita but Vo voxellator is like the brand name but we we call it oxbrita here <laughs> Yeah. yeah yeah and so okay. yeah and so yeah it's, it's interesting the differences that are in the uk you know from a larger standpoint i mean it's, it's hard for you to know because i don't think you've had experience in the americas and i haven't had experience in the uk but do you know what is do you feel like the uk healthcare system is comprehensive and com competent like do you feel like that's a uh, prevalent issue in 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 your country because in america definitely is just so many like healthcare issues that i feel like doesn't get addressed or 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 um finished yeah 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 no um <clears throat> i would say that i would say well healthcare in general is um so in america you probably do everything through insurance don't you mm -hmm. so You've got to have health insurance in America. I know, I know that much. <laughs> but um, in the UK, we have uh, something called the NHS, uh, which stands for the National Health Service, and essentially that t gets taken through our taxes. So anyone can just go to the hospital and use any of the services, like GP services, etc. We do have to obviously pay for things like prescriptions, and um, that's how you get your medication, basically. But when it comes to actual health care of sickle cell patients, um, some people would say that the health care is good. Others would say that it's concerning. Um, the S Sickle Cell Society has released um, a few reports in the past. One report is the No One's Listening report, and it goes mm. into the health um, the health inequalities that sickle cell patients face in the UK. Oh, the fact wow. that um, a lot of patients have needlessly died as a result of the lack of care, um, the lack of funding when it comes to educating nurses, oh, clinicians, wow. etc., on sickle cell. Um, there were, you know, a lot of race, racial undertones, yeah. which, you know, because people always say, well, sickle cell, it's something that just affects people of colour. Um, and that's not true because we have a growing population of people in the UK that are white or are of mixed heritage that do have sickle cell, full-blown sickle cell. And so that's really changing um, when it comes to, you know, who does it affect and what can we do about it? Um, I think the attitudes towards sickle cell care are changing slightly. You know, we are getting more funding um, mm -hmm. and more focus on sickle cell. People are speaking about it more. People are starting to care about it more. Maybe because mm -hmm. it's starting to affect other communities, not just the black community, which mm -hmm. people, of course, always thought that it did. Um, you know, it's not just a focus on that. It's loads of different people from different backgrounds that it mm -hmm. affects. Um, overall, I would say that nurses definitely need training. Um, they definitely need training, especially when it comes to going into A&E, which you might call like ED or yeah, we call it the emergency room. department. Yep. <laughs> yeah, um, because that's when I think most patients do get do complain about the treatment in ED. Um, when you get onto hematology wards, it's it's so much better because you're with nurses and doctors and it, mm. and all the clinicians that understand how to take care of a sickle cell patient who know that you need oxygen, who know that you need fluids, who know that you need anti-sickness, who know that you need very strong painkillers. So, um, yeah, the attitudes need to change. I think there's a lot of people that still think 
that sickle patients who present to ED in pain constantly, they always um, bring up the fact that they've got drug seeking behavior, which is really sad because, you know, a lot of us that we don't actually want to be on, you know, very strong painkillers, but because of the pain that we experience, we do have to go to hospital to ask for opioids and very strong painkillers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of the other things that come with having a really painful, acute uh, sickle cell crisis. So, yeah, I think attitudes do need to change. Um, I think maybe, maybe give me a year. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see in a year's time because there's quite a few different things that, um, that you know, patient organisations and the NHS are doing to try and turn things around and make sure that sickle cell is highlighted and given the same amount of care and attention that other um, genetic diseases and also other conditions are given. You know, um, I think the mission is to make it as well known as diabetes. Mm-hmm. Everyone knows what everyone knows what diabetes is. Even oh. though, even though some people get it wrong with me, um, <laughs> I always have to say I'm type one. I'm type one. So yeah, yeah. it's actually it's not my fault <laughs> that yeah, I'm type yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. You know, people try and I give too. me. Yeah, people try and give me advice as if I'm type two, like, oh, you yeah, need- like you need to do I this, this or, yeah. or you need to exercise, and that must be pressure yeah. yourself because you feel like you're getting gaslighted. Yeah, I there is um, yeah, it's it's interesting that I uh, hearing you speak, we have it feels like the American healthcare system has some similar struggles with okay. the UK in regards to sickle cell. Uh, I know racial disparity and health inequalities is definitely one of them. There's definitely a lot of reports of drug seekers uh, trying to get medications and then we are often confused <laughs> for just wanting mm-hmm. opioids or abusing it. And and I think our, our color for skin doesn't tend to help. And so, I don't know, there's a lot of racial disparity complaints. I'm I'm curious in in, in regards to like the cost are are your services uh free because I know in Canada and I believe in the UK like y'all tend to be a lot less expensive or like the, how what is that is that's that, at least that's what I've heard is is it is that the case that some of the services are provided for is that for like the NHS or getting medication or? but not necessarily the prescriptions but like um when you're in the emergency room or like going to the doctor's offices or like basic medical treatment like that yeah all of that is taken care of by the NHS oh, wow. um, that's awesome yeah yeah so essentially when we work our taxes come out of our pay slips Wow, and okay. that goes to the NHS and funds um everything. So, if you needed to go to a GP appointment, you can have unlimited amount of GP appointments, unlimited oh amount of attendances. Yeah, all of that is it, it just comes out in the in our taxes and when we when we work and earn our money, it gets taken out as like as something you don't even feel it. You just it just goes. That, that's something that I think America can can learn from. Uh, <laughs> We, we are screwed up with that. Everything oh. here about America is all about money, 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 money. Mm. And uh, I, I'm blessed enough financially for that to not be an issue. But I know there's some people with sickle cell crises who won't go to the the doctor simply because the cost. Like, they don't mm. want to go to the doctor or the hospital or emergency room. And I don't blame them because the, it is it can it can be really costly to go to their emergency room, and so some of them would literally just want to stick it out just for that reason. And so when you're talking about delays, like at least in America, that's one of the reasons for um some crisis delays into getting yeah. treatment. Um, so yeah. that's that's quite concerning because you know you think to yourself, how does that affect things like mortality rates? Yeah. Um. Because, you know, historically, and I don't know if you were told this when you were growing up, but yeah. historically you're told that if you've got sickle cell, you're not going to yeah. live long. Yeah. You won't live past 50. You won't, yeah. you might not make it to 40. Might make yeah. it to 50. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's something that's that's said to to people. And I never tell my my young people that ever. No. I say you can live to your full fullest potential and don't even think about things like that because you're going to yeah. take care of yourself. You're going to go to hospital when you need to. You're going to take your medication. Not everyone is the same. 
Um, but you've got to think like if, you know, what you've explained um, that people delay treatment or don't have treatment when they really, really need it. No. You know, the, the mortality rate must be, well, we'd have to do the research, but it must yeah. be different in the US than it is in other places where the healthcare is more accessible. Yeah. In, in, the, in the 1970s and 80s, they used to call the sickle cell a, a death sentence in America. Uh, and they used to refer it to that. And I think a lot of that, honestly, was due to the ignorance around it. Um, mm-hmm. Back then, 40, 50 years ago, we didn't know as much as we knew now about sickle cell. And so there was a lot of confusion. There was a lack of knowledge of what was actually t- to happen. And so people would literally just say it's a death sentence and, we, you know, and, 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 then that low mortality rate, that's where the numbers came from. I, I'm not, I remember when I was younger and I was learning about sickle cell, I would read about that and that was just tough to, to read, you know, just like you would read that and it's like, what? Like, I'm, I'm only going to live to 40. I was like, and like you said, there's no point even thinking about that. And, the, and it's, and it has been increasing. And, and I think a lot of that was based on previous data where, People literally didn't know how to treat sickle cell disease. Mm-hmm. Hydroxyurea wasn't a thing. Gene mm-hmm. therapy wasn't a thing. Bone marrow transplant wasn't a thing. Like all these medications and treatments we have now, they they didn't they weren't aware of. And like you said, now like thank God, like the awareness for sickle cell is increasing. Uh, there's a lot more funding being happening, and there's a lot more conversations like this. Mm-hmm. And I feel like conversations like this makes it a lot less taboo. Like, you know, I, I think at least when I was growing up and maybe I played a role in it, but sickle cell felt a lot, felt very taboo. Like I couldn't talk about it. I couldn't express my feelings about it. I would just suffer in silence. Now I have outlets like my channel, like you and other people where you, we can comfortably talk about that. And and that, that that's really a huge step towards progression, at least for me. You know? Yeah, it is. It is. And you know, you're halfway across the world (laughs) and so am I. And we're connecting through a camera. So, you know, we need that. We need community. And it's not just people that are within your reach, you know. It's it's all over the world. So it's definitely something that we can look forward to in being more connected when it comes to talking about these things. Yes. Uh, Have you, uh, one thing I did want to talk to you about was, have you watched the show Super Soul? Did you watch I that? I have watched Supercell, yes. So the oh. Sickle Cell Society were um, uh, part of that campaign of bringing Supercell to life. Nice. Um, yeah, Supercell was amazing. I really liked it. Um, and I think it really just put Sickle Cell on the map to say, actually, mm-hmm. look, we're like, we're like superheroes. We're Yeah. There's something about us that makes us so special. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't, what did you think about it? Oh, I loved it. I'm not even, to be honest, I'm not really into Netflix shows and that's kind of okay. stuff typically, but that show, I felt so seen. I felt so empowered. And I loved the concept of making Sickle Cell a superpower because mm-hmm. lately, you know, just like you, I do my best to be optimistic. And in a way, Sickle cell is a superpower because it builds resistance, it builds resilience, mm-hmm. it builds willpower, and like I feel like if you can survive sickle cell and keep mm-hmm. pushing forward despite the crises, like you're really like you're strong, like you know, mm-hmm. like you're a strong person. And I, I love the concept. I love like every time like they got stressed out, like their eyes would turn like yeah, red, and then like. I just loved it. I thought it was super cool. And then another thing I loved about it was being from America, they have this like UK perspective. Like I just love kind of getting into the world of like different countries and they they just explored so many avenues that um that um I thought was awesome. So and I know you being from the UK, you it must have been really cool to like see all that. Yeah, it was, it was, I knew, I knew about it. I actually did know that they were doing something, that we were doing something with Netflix, but um, obviously we, we did have to keep it quiet until it came out. And, um, but I watched it just the same as everyone else. I didn't get mm. like a, a preview or anything, 
But um, it was really quite nice to just see that it's being portrayed in a positive way. Yeah, because I think a lot of the pre- a lot of anything that you watch about sickle cell is it's sometimes portrayed in a negative way. People always talk to you about the complications, how you could have a stroke or a heart attack. Yeah. Or- all of these other things, which, you know, of course you do have to be aware of, but the fact that they had a really positive spin on it, yeah, I think was just really, it was nice to see. It was useful uh, information, I think, for people. Yeah. And I think also it highlighted Black British culture, which... Yeah, was really, that was really cool too. Yeah, yeah. it might have been a bit... Um, like a like maybe you were thrown into maybe what London is like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That yeah. that that the accent threw me off. Like I I, <laughs> I was like, well, like they they like, there was like hood gangsters sounding like I don't know what they were saying, but I was like, ah, cool. Like I like it. It was cool. I liked it. Like and and like it was. I felt like I was in a whole new world, and you yeah. know, um, and I just I also just. I like how like they also showed what it was like to have sickle cell. There were some scenes where mm-hmm. the mom was having a crisis, and I, I just I just loved the concept of it. I thought it was it was creative, it was fun, it was mm-hmm. engaging, and I hope I hope in the future we have more um, creative ways of expressing sickle cell because that was just so original. I was. I was I loved every single second of it. I'm not gonna lie, I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to hear that. I I loved it too, and I'm yeah. I'm excited. I'm someone who binges things, so okay. I <laughs> I'm excited for season two, so I can yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, we're looking forward to that, and yeah, and Adasa, it's been it's just been, it's been great speaking with you. I'm so glad that you got to share your story with sickle cell and type one diabetes and. I think your journey is very inspiring and you know I I'm I'm just grateful to have the time to speak with you you know before we leave this podcast and this conversation is there any anything you would like to give uh, any words of advice or a piece of inspiration or anything that your heart feels like you would like to say before leaving yeah, I think firstly, thank you for inviting me on. Yeah. Um, I think it's really important to hold space for these conversations. Um, and I think I would like to end by saying, you know, if you've got sickle cell or you are someone who is affected by sickle cell, maybe you care for someone with sickle cell, maybe your brother has it, your sister has it, anyone that you know, um, I think it's really important to have these conversations to encourage them to encourage yourself to know that it is hard um and it's it's a journey that no one but you will understand but just keep keep smiling keep being positive keep working towards your goals because you're the only one that's in control of your life and so you need to just make the most of it um keep taking your medication (laughs) keep going to hospital if you need it but of course um the main thing is take care of yourselves and make sure that you have the support around you don't be like me who didn't didn't want to talk about sickle cell because now I have a community and I just know exactly how much I was missing out on so find people who you can talk to and be safe with and yeah that's that's all I've got to say. So yeah, just keep keep being <laughs> keep being happy. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Keep let's let's keep being happy and staying positive. Yeah. Love it. For those who would like to reach out to you or or perhaps learn more about you or um you know or if there's anything you would like to promote, do you have like a social media or a way people can contact you? Um, I don't have a social media, but I do regularly um sort of feature on the society social media so I know that we are based in the UK and I know that your audience is very much um worldwide and maybe maybe, um more focused in America and other places um but the the fact is that the sickle cell society even though we're a UK charity we do sort of um get involved with other organizations so what i would say is go and visit our website or our instagram page it's sickle cell society uk um you can go on there look at any anything that you want to look at um we've got different videos on youtube as well that help to explain different things 
different complications that you can get um one of them being priorism we've got a really popular priorism video go and check that out so follow us and message us if you need any advice on things you can let us know especially if you're looking to travel to the uk what what kind of things you might need to think about um Mm. so yeah come and come and follow us on sickle cell society uk all right well you heard it folks if you're interested in traveling to the uk or joining that society you know you know where to join and reach out so Adasa, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for your presence. And thank you for sharing your story. You know, I wish you best of luck with all your endeavors. Thank you so much. And the same to you. <laughs> Bye.